Hello there guys and welcome back to this week's Longevity Weekly with me, Chris Cohen. I know it's been a while since I last saw you, but I'm excited to be back bringing you the news and updates from the world of longevity and health. So today we've got three more fascinating topics, so without further ado, let's get into it. So first of all, I want to draw your attention to a podcast that I hosted with Lady Camilla Cavendish. Now Camilla is an award-winning writer and journalist and is a regular columnist for the Financial Times. She is also the author of Extra Time, 10 Lessons for an Aging World. She has been advisor to the Prime Minister and is well known for introducing the sugar tax. Now, we talked about a host of things, mainly Camilla's view on societal longevity in the future and how governments around the world are going to deal with that. Now, it's an absolutely fascinating discussion. I really do implore you to go and watch it. So here's just a little taster clip for you. So my final question, is there something, a conversation, a piece of technology, a word of wisdom, an idea which resonated with you that you would like to share to finish off this interview? Okay, what I would love to share with you is a nursing home in Holland that I visited where university students live in in exchange for doing 30 hours a week with the old people. And it's, it, as you can imagine, it is the most heartwarming and it's very much a two-way experience. But what I'd like to quote for you is what the manager of that home said to me, which is, it used to be that when residents came, they had to fill out a hundred questions on a form. Now they only ask you three questions. And the questions are, who are you? Who were you? And who are you going to be? And when you think that the average age of residents in that care home is more than 85, that gives you a sense of the possibility and the philosophy that we should apply. Now, secondly, we're going to be talking about a brilliant article written by my colleague Alex, which compares the differences between periodic and intermittent fasting, and which is better for your health. Now, firstly, what is the difference between these two feeding strategies? Intermittent fasting involves severely restricting or eliminating calorie intake for anywhere between 12 and 48 hours, usually repeated once a week or more depending on the duration and strictness of the fasting period. Now, periodic fasting, on the other hand, involves calorie restriction or complete fasting for 48 hours up to a full week, or even longer in some cases. It is usually practiced far less frequently than intermittent fasting, rarely more than once every two weeks, and is sometimes carried out on an as-needed basis, rather than at specific intervals. Now, Alex's conclusion very much comes down to your ability to fast, and the benefits you want to derive from setting yourself a feeding strategy. If you are young and want to lose weight quickly, the safety concerns of a prolonged fast are somewhat minimal, therefore a periodic fast would work best. However, if you are older, the risk of a complete fast may be too dangerous, and to seek a more realistic and consistent approach, intermittent fasting would be the way to go. Now, finally, As has been stated many times before, the occurrence of pandemics like COVID-19 are not a question of if, but when. Now, unfortunately, there's no hard and fast rule to say that the next virus won't wait another 100 years until infecting humans. Researchers at the University of Liverpool have developed machine learning algorithms that might help us hone in on where the next coronavirus pandemic is going to start from. This is achieved by using calculations that predict the most probable species in which multiple coronavirus already exists, and which might then recombine into a new virus, which we expect is how the current coronavirus actually started. The algorithm predicts species that can host multiple coronaviruses, and takes into factors such as how genetically similar different species are, whether they share the same environment, and how compatible the coronaviruses are. The results highlight a wider range of potential hosts than was previously thought, including not just bats, but mammals that have little in common, including monkeys and camels. Now this information will help us keep a track of these potential species in which new coronaviruses may arise and transmit to humans. And that is it for this week's Longevity Weekly. So thank you so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to find out more, please go to the Gowing Life website, www.gowinglife.com, where you can find our articles about 30 things that we learnt this month, and also the Longevity FAQs, which answers all your burning questions about longevity and the fundamentals of ageing research. So go and check it out. Have a great week, and thank you so much for joining. Goodbye.